You're listening to Top Line Winnipeg with Nick and Jordan Lynham. Welcome back to the Top Line Winnipeg Jets podcast for our uh, weekly outlook. And all good things must come to an end as we record this Sunday morning after the Philadelphia game. But we'll save that for later down this weekly schedule. Let's bring in the man, Jordan Lynham. How you doing, Jordan? I'm good. I'm good. I, I'm thinking it's uh, probably good for the Jets that they don't play again until Tuesday, eh? I think so. I think so. This is a team that just finished up nine games in a 15-day stretch. Eight and one in that stretch. And they won eight in a row during that stretch for a franchise record win streak. I saw some overreactions all uh, on social media, and that's probably to be expected. That's just sports fandom. What's your big takeaway from this last nine games, man? This team's legit. If there's any, if there's any naysayers before the streak, I mean, the, it's not like they were in a bad position before they they no. started the streak. But uh, if there's anyone that didn't believe in them before, I don't know how you don't believe in them now. It's one of those things too, where yeah, you could look at this streak and look at the opponents and be like, well, this is a pretty uh, underwhelming group. But if you're a one of the upper echelon teams in the league, these are the games you have to take care of. Like we've seen so many times in the past. The mediocre version of the Jets. A stretch like this, they might go 500. They yeah. would take some of those teams for granted, and they would just walk all over them. We didn't see them, that. This streak started with basically ending the Minnesota Wild season. I don't know if you've seen what's happened to them since. They've had a the inverse of our streak, eh? They're on a similar trajectory, but Nine straight opposite. games of three goals against or more. Um, they have not won in regulation, I believe, since. Or lost in regulation since. I, I don't know. It's not, They're on like a nine-game heater right now. They just got booed off home ice. Um, you could say the Winnipeg Jets broke them. At, at that point, if, if Minnesota won that back-to-back, they were fighting for the wildcard spot with the Jets. And now they're like 16 points back or something like that. Blow it up, Billy. Yeah, blow it up, Billy. I don't think he's becoming available, though. I, that's the one I can't get myself excited for. Six years at $5 million for that guy. Can't see them moving him. Come on, Garen. You need to shake that, uh, shake that core up somehow. <laughs> I, th- I think, see, the way I look at the Erickson X thing is because I think he's a dream, dream fit. I think a lot of teams would see that. We're seeing it out of Vancouver now. Vancouver. The interesting part about the Vancouver Winnipeg thing, both teams are going into the deadline with the same needs. With the exact same needs. So we were talking about this the other day. I do not like, especially with Jim Rutherford. Right, it's Jim this, Rutherford there, right? Yeah, with Patrick that, Galvin. He loves to trade. And he'll take the big swing. And Yeah, he. we've seen it. We've yeah. seen it in Pittsburgh. I, I know he's not the GM now, but come on. What's fascinating is, and this is why I think we're going to get into this convo, especially over the coming weeks. This is why I think people have to wrap their uh, heads around the idea that the Winnipeg Jets are going to need to add. Because the teams they're directly competing with are chasing those same pieces. And it's going to come at a cost. Colorado Avalanche, we know, is in the 2C market. And they might be getting Landeskog back for the playoffs now. Massive development down there. <clears throat> the Dallas Stars are shooting for a top four defenseman. Vancouver, the top Vancouver four right now. Vancouver gets a top 2C. If they get a 2C, good fucking luck. Their center depth, because they have <laughs> Pedersen on the wing right now. But if you get a, at any point in the playoffs, you can run Pedersen, Miller, insert 2C here also. It helps, yeah. Their yeah. wings are a little, a little lax there, though. That's where it gets a little tough. But yeah, their star talents carrying them right now in Demko. So, what I'm trying to say is, the teams around us are going to be looking to get better. So we're going to have conversations about trying to get better, despite just how good this Winnipeg Jets team's been. Let's break down the week it was, and then we'll get into some of these conversations. We last recorded right before the Arizona game, and we were kind of thinking, you know what? I thought it was a trap game for sure. I thought it was a trap game too. You know, it felt like the one the boys had won five in a row, had just become number one team in the NHL. They were out going out golfing with their old mans. I would have forgiven them if that was a trap game, and we saw the exact opposite. Oh, it was a shit kicking. They dominated the Arizona cow. It was another example of, and this is something I think they've done pretty well too. They've beat up on the East. They've beat up on the teams below them. They've really beat up on the teams below them in the Central. Every single one at a time when Mini, Mini was in a wild card spot, the Jets made sure, hey, it's stopping right there. Arizona's flirted with a wild card spot for times that, during this stretch. Hey, just absolutely t- took it to them. 
reminded them who like the top of the division is. I like seeing that shit. How about you? Oh yeah, it was great to watch. Like uh, if you listened last week, I know the episode came out after that game, but you know I had very low expectations going expectations going in, mm-hmm. and just a that was a game where both of those goals were like not good on Helly. Yeah, like that could have easily been a six nothing game. That looked just, like a just, bored Hella bucket. They just controlled play. They were the better team for the whole game. Like it, it wasn't much of a game at all. Like it was everything you wanted to see out of that team going into Arizona. <laughs> at the end of that road trip, the end of the dad's trip, you know there was some beers being drank on the course the day before. Uh, you definitely like a, definitely didn't think that was gonna happen, and they just absolutely shit kicked them. Nice to see Shaif uh, get that little monkey that was on his back off with two two goals in that one. That line contributed at three. Dylan Sandberg uh, this week showing some flash offensively with a couple play uh, setups. He jumped in in that game, set up Nick Ehlers, and then later this week he set up uh, Perfetti. If if his he's another guy I keep saying like if his offensive game grows, we have like a really 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 good defenseman there, man. He quietly might be the one of the better stories of the season this year. Like uh, we were both pretty high on him last year. In what it would have been, I guess that would have been his rookie season last year, yeah? For sure. And this year, even more steps forward. You don't see a lot of the silly turnovers you saw last year in the D zone. Mm -hmm. Very calm with the puck. Very, uh, he's just a presence back there with Nate Schmidt. Allows Schmidt to kind of do what he has been better at throughout his career. And he's really had a nice bounce back this last month, man. Yeah, he's been solid. They still are near the top in expected goals against. Mind you... Expected goals goal. for is pretty low, and and they play against lesser competition for the most part. But man, what a season fifty four has had! That is such a premium though add to this team. Like the one thing you're getting such great performance out of that deep pairing against bottom teams that you're basically cutting off the offense from teams' depth with the way that that pair is rolling right now. It's a big plus to what's going on here. I think Nate Schmidt looks like he's skating better again. Looks like he found his legs. And you know what? He's been on a roll here where that pair, yeah, they're starting to contribute more offensively. I also like the little tweak on power play too. Uh, Pionk used to be quarterbacking it up at the top, and now it's Schmidt with Pionk on the side looking for that one-timer. Um, I just, you know, you got to be happy. Obviously, the contract's one thing, but you got to be happy with the the game you've gotten from him compared with what you saw earlier on in that year, despite maybe not being a six million dollar player. No, completely agree. Have you uh, speaking of power play too? This is a little off topic. Have you noticed the little set play that Perfetti and Nemestikov have? Mm-hmm. That's about the only good thing you could say about their power play the last week or so. But that uh, power play too again still looks better, and they're starting to use them earlier now too. Yeah, just like the like we talk about movement all the time. Mm-hmm. And if you if you aren't familiar with what you're talking about, you'll see or what we're talking about. When power play two is out there, you'll see Perfetti on the right wall, and the Mesnikov kind of creeps up in the corner, and Perfetti will dish it off to him, take the corner, and the Mesnikov will take fill Perfetti's spot, and it's a wide open give and go. It almost worked for like two goals in the last five minutes against Chicago, but uh, obviously they didn't score on him, but. The best chances that we've seen, again, last night against Philly, it worked a couple of times to create a quality chance. And it's, it's the power play two doesn't finish very well, but uh, it is something that I've uh, I've kind of noticed in the power play and I wanted to talk about today. Even the power play one, I will say, has had some more movement of late. There was a set play off of Mark Shifley, and I, I thought the TSN broadcast did a really good job highlighting it too. Um off one of the draws where he went it back and immediately raced around the net and became an option on the, the weak side. It became a give and go from the D down to him. And it creates an opportunity, right? If you look at some of the best power plays in this league, the Tampa Bays, when they're at their peak, the uh, not the Ottawa, uh, the Edmonton Oilers, Vancouver right now, um, there's a lot of movement from their star players that makes it uh, hard to defend. And I think you're starting to see that wrinkle. It's not there fully, but it's really something that this team needs to figure out from that aspect of things. And you're seeing you're seeing some more set stuff now. We'll see what that kind of looks like in time. Obviously now, for the next week, maybe even less, don't have two of their big contributors in that regard, and Cal Connor and Mark Shifley now. But 
Yeah, uh, optimism at least. And we moved into Columbus. Went to the game with uh, some of Jets Twitter. We were pretty rowdy up at 3.30. Uh, it was a great time. And another absolute ass kicking. Oh. Columbus felt like they got absolutely nothing of quality against. <laughs> nothing. And you saw, credit to Columbus, some of the players afterwards talking about it and Pascal Vincent. What a stark difference now the quotes that are coming out of other teams trying to play against the Winnipeg Jets compared to years past. We're only like 14 months removed from Boston's head coach publicly talking about how small and easy to, to get to the slot the Winnipeg Jets are against. And like that was kind of eye-opening to hear another coach say. Now we're hearing the complete opposite, how this is one of the toughest teams to generate any offense from. And I thought this game... Was a prime example of it. Well, it takes you back to the the Murat stat from when he or Murat stat, sorry, <coughs> where once the once the team has been in the jet zone for seven seconds, the play is dead. Like they're not, mm-hmm. no one's creating offense against this team right now. And it, it's cra- like it's it's crazy how well this team is defensive, knowing the parts at work. Mm-hmm. Like this decor is is it any different than last year's? No. <laughs> So what's the start? Like, what's the difference? Like, it's is it just the buy-in factor? Is it everyone's just bought in on Bone System this year? Does it, does it take an extra year to get to it? It's just there's something about this team, man. It's, it, it feels special. And I just, when it's operating, when you see a team like this operating above the sum of all their parts, it's just so fun to watch. Well, and and it's not even just us watching. And seeing that the Jets are just impossible to generate against, like this is a f- this is truly a five man unit working back there, and I think that's the biggest gap. In years past, it was almost coached that in the offensive zone, the D were supposed to be the defensemen, just as point guys, and the fours were supposed to do all the work. And really, hockey's a five man sport in all three zones. In the D zone, the Jets have become a bit more dangerous offensively because defense are now jumping in and creating that extra man to have to deal with. Same thing works on the uh, defensive side, having a guy like Mark Scheifele now completely bought in. But also having big, strong defensive forwards, like a Gabe Velarde. How often are you seeing him get beat one-on-one in a battle? On the boards? On the boards or even in open ice if he has positioning on that guy. That's a defensive stopper out of nowhere. Brendan Dillon, Dillon DeMello, who has been fantastic this year, honestly. like That guy is the one guy that's not gotten a lot of praise. Um, being at the Chicago game, when he went down, it was like the first moment I went like, he's one of a select guy, a few guys I don't think this team could replace right now. Uh, Sandberg and Schmidt becoming a lockdown. Like, you're getting it across the lineup in different parts, but you're getting it through all five guys. When other teams are in the D zone, watch the slot area. You have one guy attacking, and then the team is so tight protecting that house. How are you supposed to generate against it? Yeah, it's it's nuts, and uh, and the numbers backing up. And the, you see the updated today. I didn't see the updated once today. Through forty one games, so this is like this is the halfway point. Halfway mark, yeah. This is impressive. The Winnipeg Jets are the number one team in five on five expected goals against per sixty. Per 60 minutes of ice time against at 5 and 5, they allow what would be expected two goals against. 2.12. Lowest in the league. And that's pretty good when you have a goalie that's stopping. Both goalies. Well, yeah, you have this both goalies. This run, too, man. We're going to get into him in but the Chicago game. I but. think per money puck, or Helly's almost like 20 goals saved above expected. So you, you mix in those two things. It's pretty dangerous. That's a pretty tough team to play against. Um, while we're here, let's talk about it because... Uh, I had a little bit of a. I was I was playing a bit of contrarian on Twitter this week because uh, Garrett, we're we're see, we're at the point where we're seeing people want a target, a, a top right, and a D man. Um, obviously, the preference I think for both of us, we've talked about this, is a puck mover that bumps Pionk into that third spot where him and P- Schmidt or whatever that kind of looks like play alongside Sandberg. But then the idea was like a Chris Tanev, who I've mentioned on here before. How he is such an elite defensive defenseman. And I almost look at this roster and think, like, as far as fixing the holes, the puck mover makes way more sense. But then I started thinking about, like, the Blue Jays and baseball and how 
when it comes to the playoffs, sometimes it's those pitching staffs with the lights out bullpens that you you have to you have to you only have to get to two goals or two runs, right? In a sense, I don't think it's perfect, and this isn't me asking for it, but I think there's an argument to be made that if they did get like a defensive piece like that, that you're gonna see a, a Rick Bonus team in the mold that he did in Dallas go go on a run based on the fact it's a race to two. And with this goaltender and this defensive presence, I, I I wonder about it at least, you know. Yeah, I definitely don't hate it. Um I used to have a teacher that used to say, Oh, practice what you know. And that kinda that kind of fits into that kind of uh, sort of thinking. Mm-hmm. Also the Jets have gotten extremely lucky back on the decor. And you were at the health-wise. health-wise. Yeah. You were at the game, so you didn't hear this. But on the broadcast, I think it was his name, John Short, that uh, was the color guy, was talking about how the Jets are the only team or one of two teams that have had five of their first game starters on defense play every game this year. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty crazy. And the only two that switch are Sandberg Stan- or uh, Schmidt Stanley. Because of the choice, yeah, yeah. So Sandberg... Morrissey, DeMello, Pionk, Dylan have played every game this year. That's not going to hold up. Yeah, and so, so along the same lines as you just said about the uh, practice, which you know, there is a there is an idea in sports, and this mostly comes in baseball when we're talking about lineups and stuff like that, where you double down on what you're a lead on, and you're just that much better in that area than everybody else. And when you have two guys performing at the goaltending level you're getting, you have the team D structure. I do think it's something to contemplate. And you know what? Watching yesterday, it really convinced me that I think I am leaning that the 2C is way more important than the defensive help right now. I, I would completely agree. But even in that conversation, when we're talking about 2C, a lot of the guys we talk about are two-way centers that are very good defensively. And it just that fits into this team's mold so well. Like, this isn't the... The Jets of 17-18 where they're going to score five, six goals on you every night. It's just, it's a different mold. It's a, still a really good mold, but I think adding, like, obviously with Shife gone, you need a two seed. Mm-hmm. Well, not with Shife gone, but with Shife being gone highlights how much that a center, center depth is missing. And Lowry stepped in fine, I think, on the first line, better than I think he would have in years past. Like, he's having a beast of a season. For sure, for sure. But, uh... You absolutely, going into playoffs, like we said, you're competing with very good teams for the same position. All those teams are going to be looking to add. You you have to shore up that center depth. You you just absolutely have to. And yeah, we'll get more in-depth into that center conversation when we get to the Flyers game here because I think that's where it really got highlighted, and we'll get into that. Let's talk about Chicago because this looked like for 56 minutes where the streak was going to end, and... It was funny. We were looking at the odds before the game, and I'm like, man, they had Winnipeg at minus 450, I think it was, and Chicago at plus 350. And I, I almost sprinkled some money on Chicago just because you don't hockey, see lines you don't like know. that. Yeah, hockey, like even in the most egregious game, if you're giving me a three and a half to one dog, I think I gotta chase it. Whereas if you're you're paying me. Minus 450, like, that's not a great return on a 2-1 hockey game, man. Like, if you bet on the Jets, you're probably feeling That was it. a sweat. <laughs> yeah. So, this game went last minute uh, through the storm. Great crowd. I was surprised. You were in attendance for that Yeah, one I was. I didn't think. I wasn't thinking the Bedard factor, which would have played into this for sure. Yep. But I'm thinking bad weather. We're going to see like an 10, 11,000 seater tonight. Like, I thought it was going to be. You're playing an AHL roster essentially. No Bedard, yeah. no Hall, no Beauvillier, no Seth, no Seth Jones. Jones. Like, whoever they send in the All Star game is going to be a career AHL player at this point. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, there's, there's no way. Not accounting for the Bedard factor would have sold the tickets at the start of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Yeah, packed house. There was still some empty seats. That's to be expected with the weather that we did have. Yeah, but it was a sellout. But it was a sellout, and it was a pretty electric crowd for what turned to be the last five minutes. The crowd at at the Canada Life Center is back. Like, people are going there expecting something to happen. Like, you could tell the buzz is different in there. And Winnipeg Jets made the crowd wait for 56 minutes to finally let it go. I thought that was a really poor hockey game. Oh, it's terrible. They had a really good start. Probably the first eight minutes or so, they were all over Chicago. And then they fell asleep until the third period. And they got dominated for the next 40. And then 
Yeah, they started gaining some momentum in the third, and finally, Gabe Velarde from Adam Lowry and Josh Morrissey, both guys, I thought that was like a leadership. Oh, night. the leadership took that team on their backs that night. 100%. How many two on ones did Morrissey stop there in the last few minutes, even when the puck came back the other way? He looked like an. He's our best player. 100% he is. I don't think it's a comfort. Like, remember we were debating the MVP? I think it's been a runaway since. Like, we were talking about at the start. Chef Lee versus Morrissey. And Morrissey. You kind of knew going into the season he wasn't going to put up 75 points again. Yeah. Like, that's that's a career season. You could argue he's been better than last year. I, th- I think it's not close, if I'm being completely honest. Like, I, I said this in the morning after, the day after, but we gave so much attention trying to build Morrissey in the Norris case last year because the points were there. I think we're almost doing a dis- him a disservice by not being more vocal about it this year. He has been a better overall defenseman like last year and we talked about it a lot i felt he cheated a lot defensively oh, to get those 75 points and i was more than okay with it because it was so much more valuable to what this team yeah, did. The team needed it he's found that happy medium where he's been a shutdown guy on the other side and he's still pacing what 60 plus like he has firmly been a top three four at worst five defenseman in the nhl this year even i saw the spin chicklets guy did their central predictions or updated predictions or whatever and uh, R.A. quickly was like, Winnipeg. And then Biz was like, I think Winnipeg, but Dallas has high skin in, and he's an ace on D, and I don't know if any of the – I don't know if Winnipeg can match. Matt, high skin is a great defenseman, and I tweeted this at Biz, and you know what? He acknowledged it. You're underselling Josh Morrissey this year if you don't have him in the ace in the NHL. He's got to be in that potential finalist for the North there's, for sure. There's one D-man better than him in the Central. Yeah, Kill McCarr. He's the best defensive man in the world. Uh, I I can't even argue that one. I got McCarr Hughes ahead of him for sure. Those are the two guys for sure this year. After that, I have Morrissey up there with anybody. He has been the absolute rock at both ends of the ice. He impacts the game that much. I thought Dad nailed it too. Like Dad was so impressed with his game that year or that night that he didn't think uh, we win that game without Josh Morrissey. I yeah. You don't. We've had so many nights like that where, just quietly, he has been what we expect. I guess at this point, where he is outside of Connor Hellbuck, the MVP of this team, in my opinion. So how about the uh, the moment Ehlers puck went in there? That's what sports fandom and live sports is all about, man. Like that game went from like so like frustrating and like not entertaining. Honestly, shout out Bross. He made some pretty big saves for 20 shots against. Like, they're, they were a bit leaky that night. And I thought Bross did a great job shutting the door and keeping it at one. And then that Nick Ehlers pop in that arena, man. That was the biggest pop, most electric regular season moment I've been a part of probably since the 18 run. Oh, yeah. That, that's a, that hit a level that I haven't heard there in years. It, it was right up there with a round one from last year, Vegas pop. Like, it really was. The, and, and that's what, like, doing that CBC interview the next day after it and getting called a super fan. Anybody that goes to an arena and gets to sit with 15,000 15, other people and get to experience a moment like that is going to become a fan of that experience. That was everything you wanted. Like, I'm going to remember Nick Ehlers scoring the game-winning goal with a minute five left against the worst team in the NHL in the middle of January Uh, forever. On, on like, Peter Mrazek. He's not anything special. (laughs) Forever because of that pop. Oh, yeah. That was pure electricity. And, like, Nick Ehlers, man, we got to give this guy some more love. Like, we pounded the door on him getting more than 14 minutes a night. And it's time to take a little bit of a victory lap here. Since getting promoted to the top line, November 30th, he is tied for number one in the NHL, the entire NHL, with Elias Patterson for most five-on-five points. Pretty good company. Number one. And two, two weeks ago, we had a big account in Jets Twitter talking about him bringing nothing to the top line. It was time to trade him. Number one in the NHL, Jordan. This guy's this guy's a superstar. He absolutely is. He, he absolutely has been. His his play has been phenomenal. You could tell that last ten minutes that he was buzzing. Like there was something coming. He was shooting from anywhere. He was looking for that top corner on Mirazik like, all night. Yeah. 
Side note, does anyone take more slap shots in the NHL than Nick Ehlers? At this point, no. <laughs> I, I don't think there is. Like, there is, there's It's that quick be, one, too, with traffic. There's got to be no one in the league that takes more slap shots than Nick Ehlers. I'll, we'll have to find some stats on that or something, because that's a die. It's a dying skill, but fuck does he love to rip the clapper. He's an absolute electric factory, and I, I had someone reach out on Facebook about him just saying, like, I think the nerds kind of won on this one. Like, clearly he's the guy all the analytics people have talked about. But I find that narrative odd because anytime I watch hockey with guys we pl- grew up playing hockey with, who's the one guy they rave about all the time? Any Anybody of mine that starts getting into hockey, the one guy they talk about at the end of the night when leaving the rink was Nick Ehlers. Like, it's a... If you don't like Nick Ehlers, honestly, it's on you as a hockey fan. It, it, it 100% is. Like, you don't know what you're watching. You, you either hate that he's not a Canadian-born player or something because... This is a guy that is fully accountable on his bad nights after. Like, he is one of the his harshest of critics. There is nothing anyone can say that he's not saying worse about himself. I like to see that for coming from a professional. We talked about accountability for years, months on this podcast. He's got all the talent in the fucking world. He's a human highlight reel when he wants to be. Yeah, he makes some bonehead passes. Like, yeah, that's... Clear, clearly, he, we're not saying he's perfect. But what he brings to the game, what he brings to the atmosphere, what he brings to the Jets' top line, this is one of the first guys, this is one of the only skilled players that will drop his gloves at the, as soon as something like bad happens. Vladimir Mestikov takes a bad hit. Oh, don't worry, Nick Ehlers is there. How can you not like this guy? This is, this is what everybody wants in a hockey player. But, oh, there's a couple of bad passes. Everything else outweighs, the, outweighs those three, two to three bad passes that every fucking guy makes. It is. It's like it's absurd. It's nice to see the guy that you want to see get the ice time succeed when he gets the ice time. He was held back behind Blake Wheeler for five, six years. And this isn't just a Paul Maurice thing because he was held back last by, year by too. Rick Bonus. Oh, no, hundred percent. We we had the prime Blake Wheeler replacement in house, and we would just not get out the. We wouldn't put the old carcass out of the way to bring the new new yeah. one in. Wouldn't take him behind the shed. No, we we, we wouldn't, and uh, that's why it was funny to watch uh, Jim Toth get lit up a little bit this week with the Blake Wheeler. <laughs> You're about to find out how valuable he is. Well, we're finding out how valuable he was for all the wrong reasons right now. Let's move on to the the streak breaker, <laughs> Philly. Yesterday, Hockey Night in Canada, Saturday. What'd you think? No Mark Shifley. Mark Shifley left the Blackhawks game with, I missed it in-house. Yeah, I missed it too. I was, uh, yeah. I was just getting back to my seats. It seemed to be a growing. I heard optimism yesterday morning, and then we got the day-to-day prognosis. From what I was told, they were only expecting he was for sure going to miss a Saturday, and then was open-minded from there. I'm hoping that's accurate. But it, this team clearly missed Mark Shifley yesterday. What'd you see? I agree with you. Like, uh... There was very outside of Gabriel Velarde and Nino Niederreiter, who we can get into that in a second. There was very little offense creation, and that's obviously that's where Shifley comes in so well. Yeah, I th- like I said buddy. earlier, I think Lowry did a fine job stepping in in that role. I don't. He's obviously not the answer long term. In years past, it wouldn't have looked good at all, but. Uh, they got dominated the first half. They did, to their credit, they did look a lot better in the second half. Especially the third period. That was the Samuel Earson. Since Helly's run has been the third hottest goalie in the league. Yeah. Less games played, I think, because I, I don't I think Hart's the starter there right now. Mm-hmm. But he you he had a great game too. Like he made some big saves there for him. But uh, it did look it did look a lot like a team that's playing their ninth game in fifteen nights. The one area of concern, really, for this one was the Nino Niederreiter line. And a guy that we've had a lot of conversations about on the show this year, Mason Appleton, was not his best night. It was very much not his best night. And he led the game in even strength minutes. Yeah, that's where I want to go with that one, too. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what you saw. I thought the Jets really had a slow start to this one. But for, let's say, the last 35 minutes of that hockey game, they clearly pushed and pushed and pushed. They just couldn't score one. Um, so for me, <laughs> I saw some people, and it's, I get it based on years past, that last night was the indicator that we're going to get that February collapse. I thought yesterday was, honestly, 
how do I want to frame this? Another credit to Rick Bonus's outburst providing answers in a sense. Because what was the one thing leaving last year it was the pushback. Yeah. Despite not having it, and this is a team that played nine games in 15 days. It's a lot. And after watching, you know, Chuck Halibut's vlogs and stuff and watching just how much is going on, I think you can get an appreciation of being worn out nine games in. I don't want to lean on the injury thing because, you know, Philly was lost Coots, didn't have Drysdale. They were pretty outman too. I just think we were, at some point we were due. I said it in that CBC hit. This seemed like the, the spot. And that's okay. Yeah. What I want to credit the group with is, the pushback over that 35 minutes because they did make a real run at trying to get into this game. And, man, in that arena, just sitting in it, all that crowd needed to give the – like, Rick Bonus gave the crowd a lot of credit in the Chicago game for sticking in it despite not scoring and stuff. That building would have absolutely erupted yesterday if they scored one goal. There, you know it's going to be a loud reaction when they start going nuts about cycling and getting chances. That building was just urging for one. Unfortunately, we, we didn't get it. You're not going to win any games when uh, scoring zero, of course. But I think you got to give credit. They really, it was too little, too late. They couldn't get one over. But they did push back the last 35 minutes in a way that I don't think previous versions would have. No, I agree. But uh, one thing... That comes of that, and we've talked about this a bunch. What's what's going on with the Jets in the first periods this year? Well, it's interesting because it's, I, I, it's been kind of back and forth. Like I said, I thought the first eight minutes of the Chicago game, it was all at Winnipeg, and then they fell asleep. It almost seems like it's rotating. Like Arizona, they came out hot too, but then I think it was the game before that it took like 10 minutes. I just think it's one of those things that... You think it's a nothing maybe, burger? Yeah, I think, it's, I, I think at this point... It's been inconsistent enough that I don't think it is really much. But I wanted to go where you were going. Um, because accountability is top down. And I think Rick Bonus has to look at himself in the face on this one a little bit too. He's the first guy that wants to preach it as well. I think there's some acknowledgement that how he's kind of managing things through this injury yesterday hurt the team. Mason Appleton, how is that guy leading your, your team? And even Shank Mintz. When you're missing two of your best offensive players, Mason Appleton hasn't scored a goal in 25 games. Like, we got to really talk about this. And I think, based on anybody watching that game, could tell you he was the worst player on the ice. Yeah, he definitely, he was. How all you have to do is look at well. Twitter and keep refreshing, and all you'd see is uh, some, uh, some Appleton takes. He was definitely not good. Uh, it sucks because I think Nino was one of the the two players on the Jets last night that were looking to Could create something it. and they were buzzing. It was him and Velarde for me that were by bar none the two best players on the ice last night. It wasn't I like Larry and Perfetti too, but yeah. I I think they had good games. This isn't to dis yeah to discourage or not discourage to dispel what they did, but without a doubt those two were the two best players. I think Nino just he was drowning on his own he was carrying two anchors and the idea to go – there's a few things. Because the idea to go with Kupari there, who was struggling before he got hurt, played one game in the AHL, and then all of a sudden he's going to be playing 15 minutes last night for the first for the first two periods. I didn't understand that. Moving up Toninato, it really wasn't much of a difference, though. Yeah. That's a game where you got to stack your top six. I agree. you got to get Nino up there, drag I follow down, make that a defensive – third line that's not getting beat by Philly's bottom six and you got you got put your best players against Philly's best players last night and you hope you come through with a win yeah I think I think that the answer was really simple too and I'm disappointed we didn't even see it tried the one line I keep saying I want to see and I feel like this is the moment there's something to be said about the way Nino Vlad and Perfetti would play off each other and when you're you're down Mark Shifley you're down Kyle Connor and you're a team that You've gotten offensive contributions from top down, but going into a single game without those two, you're probably not looked at from a matchup wise as a scary offensive team. You've got to give yourself as much offensive chance as possible. Nino was absolutely drowning beside Appleton, Kupari, and Toninato. Like, 
give that guy. The, the, Nino is a top six forward on this team. Oh, he's easily. been playing on the, the the third line, whatever you want to call it, which he's, has been good for us. That's correct, correct. That's what good teams have. But Nino is a top six forward in the NHL. Twenty goal guy. Give him a chance to impact that game. Put him with Vlad and Perfetti. I have Fallow too, man. He's really kind of fallen off. He he had the points on the Sheffield line. I, he's gotten like two points since coming off that line. Um, there's a conversation we had there. I like the Lowry Velarde. Ehlers look. I think you you keep it together while Shifley's gone. Yeah, it's, the thing is perfectly fine. The one thing going in, and I get it because yeah, my brain went there too, and I can't I can't not think like this. It's almost funny. You want for the team in the moment standpoint, you want Adam Lowry to be successful in that role, and he did in that first game against Chicago. Like we said, him and Morrissey really drove that bus. But then you're like, oh shit, if he's really good in this role, maybe we don't go get a two C, and then it hampers them later. I think yesterday was screaming obvious this team needs a 2C. Oh, without a doubt. But, yeah, I think Bones has to take this one on a, a bit on the chin. Like, Mason Appleton cannot be leading your team in even strength of ice time. No. Especially when you need goals and you're you're down in a game and this guy hasn't scored in 20, 25 games, Jordan. They've yeah. played 41. He's nearing the Adam Lowry streak of last year. Was Lowry's like 31 or something like that? This is a guy, and like, I don't want to shit on the player. Uh, and I'm honestly, I, I'm not a body language guy, but I, yesterday being in the arena, you could tell like he's lost all confidence. Like there's, I'm, I'm, I'm someone that if I see a player frustrated, personally, that doesn't bother me. Like I like to they see, they should the, be frustrated. They should be frustrated. These are pros. And if they can harness that into positive results, let it out sometimes. Like we got to remember, these are emotional people. The body language last night on Mason Appleton looked like a guy that's defeated. And I think that's a little bit of a different vibe than being frustrated so many problems coming off his stick and going the other way so many missed opportunities and tight on the net coming off his stick at some point i know the idea has been about that line that line probably can use an upgrade even even with lowry and apple you know together let's be honest Absolutely. And this is a guy, this is what's so funny to me, and I don't want to take it out on Mason Appleton, but this is a guy that 12 games in, I got buried on Twitter. My credibility was all lost covering this team because I said Mason Appleton could be upgraded at $2.1 million. Absolutely, he could. (laughs) If we're being honest, going into the deadline, if you need to move salary off this roster to upgrade, he's probably the first name. It's hard to move one of those D. 2.1 mil for him? You... Look at the Bolivier Horvat deal. Yeah, he well, becomes the Bolivier in this kind of a trade. I still think Schmidt goes, but I don't think so until the uh, off season. Now, I don't think we're. I think they they're just gonna roll that. I think. I don't know. It's gonna but, be interesting. But I I agree. I he's the first. I thought we both thought it was going into last trade deadline that he's the guy that goes into just to make money work. And it's it's an like for me he is the exact definition of guy like he's an nhl player well no there's there's nothing wrong with mason appleton being on an nhl roster but he's for me he's a fourth line player that you can maybe bump up when he's hot for a stretch uh give him some life but he's not a 2.1 million dollar top nine minute a night 14 minute a night player on a team that's trying to win a cup and that's what we're trying to get to here right we're talking we're, we're talking about taking the next steps to win a cup this you you can't have stretches like this in your top nine. Come playoff time. Nope. Get him going. Anyways, um, yeah, I feel like my credibility is back intact, but maybe maybe not. I'll let I'll let the people know. I'll, I'll let them let me know. Um, on the Appleton thing though, Elliot Friedman brought up an interesting name with the Winnipeg Jets. Another one that made me feel pretty vindicated because uh, it was a name I was kind of calling for in the summer. Though in the summer it would have been it seems like it would have been a better opportunity. Matthew Joseph um, with Ottawa. He's a right winger, more offensive-minded. I think he would fit the Adam Lowry Nino spot and be able to actually score on that spot. Um, he was kind of getting shopped in the summer because they had to free up captain, uh, sign Shane Pinto. Then the whole gambling thing happens. Matthew Joseph comes in on an absolute tear to start this year, and now we're talking about an actual asset. I, I'm intrigued by the idea of him replacing Mason Appleton on that third line. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, I I'm absolutely on board. Just it can't be your only move. Like correct. That's a that's a secondary move with the deadline type of thing. That's correct. that's not what you're headlining with. And if you can get it done, sweet. 
if not, it's not the end of the world, but I think that is a, a guy that would shore up our depths quite well. Yeah, and it's a guy with a couple years of term, just under three mil. You basically want to get out of Appleton to do that. It's an 800K difference, but you're getting a better offensive player for the next couple of years. Like, yeah, and you, like you likely see more offense out of your third line again, like at the start of the season when they were shooting a million percent. On a more consistent basis, probably. Yeah. But yeah, it it that it can't be the priority. The priority is two C, and if you get a two C, doesn't Vlad Nemesikov become that three right wing? Like you've been talking about, and I think you're right. You can't just put him on the fourth line. The the, the player you're getting out of him. Do you look at something like Nino Lowry Nemesikov if you go get a two C? You could. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be a, that'd be a load to play against. These are uh, great quite, combos. Yeah, great. Great problems to have with, uh, oh, God, he's too good to play on the fourth line type of uh, conversations that we're having here. But, yeah, I agree. Uh, I I don't. And then you have Matthew Joseph on your fourth line. So what's the – that's even better. Like, that's him him and whoever, really, on that fourth. Like, our fourth line has been great. Whoever plays on it has been doing well. But if you could upgrade it, why not? That's the thing. You're trying to get to the best possible spot. With your best possible twenty three, you want your roster. you want your best twelve forwards playing. Yeah, every night. If they're in Ottawa, do they just go take Giroux too? So here's a here's a something that was sent my way this week, and I'm curious your thoughts on it because I don't see this. Th- I think this is an off season thing. Okay, I don't think this is an in season thing. Uh, and this kind of pairs with what Friedman ended up reporting a few days later. Ottawa's in a spot right now where they're starting to get worried about the culture. And this person mentioned this name, and then Friedman mentioned his name first. And that's always like a tell to me when he, the first name linked there. If Ottawa goes the route of the Winnipeg Jets from last summer, and they decide to trade a core piece for depth, let's say they're emulating the PLD trade. Alex Affel, does he look good in that kind of deal as being one of the Ford representatives at $4 million if you're going to bring back a Shabbat, let's say? I can see it. That's uh, it's just something to watch for. It's just a, a a thing that people are talking about. But I don't think it happens till summer. I don't think Ottawa does something big till the summer. He's one of those guys that's a like quote unquote professional that you want in your room, and the money's really easy. Um, the one thing that we haven't talked about as much yet is the idea that because of where the farm is, because of where Rucker Re- Re- McGordy's development looks, because of where Brad Lambert's development where looks. In the summer, you likely do see a veteran forward moved off. Oh, well, you for have money, to, right? Why wouldn't you? And you could up, you could use that money on D. Bingo. And you would still hope to get out of one of the six million dollar guys if you're still doing this, but you're you're looking to cycle some things around and make some room, right? Something for down the line. Something to think about down the line. It just I found it really interesting how much it was kind of talked about this week. The Schmidt thing's interesting. I think it's a summer thing. I could I could see that, Mike. Like, so Mike, I I was all in on him being gone. Then this stretch of plays happened, and the one thing looking back at how Kevin Shevelday's operated, it's not normal to carry eight D all the time. It's normal to go like fourteen and seven yeah, practices yeah. is easier. I think we're gonna see him approach this deadline and try and get through with as many of. He might add to it still, but still try and get through with the six we have in right now. Uh, a seventh guy coming in that's probably going to impact the lineup, which bumps a, maybe a Schmidt to number seven, who you could still trust to come in as a vet that's done it, and then still have a number eight in Ville Hanel in the minors. I think that's where we're going. So you're eight deep going into the playoffs. I think that's where we're going. My thought process is just how important is he in that dressing room right now? 100%. That's why I think it's a summer thing, too. That's one of those... It's an expensive... Locker room piece to have, but just the way everyone talks about him. And he's playing quality hockey. He's man. playing good right now. Yeah. Like, he still might not be a $6 million guy, but he's playing serviceable. Yep. But I just, taking that out of the room could throw a wrench into things. So the keeping it, like, a lot of the talk about keeping it light, not t- getting too serious, you know, the team gets along really well right now. How much of that is Nate Schmidt? 100%. I, I I think he's going to be your playoff seven. That would be my bet today. And I do think he'd be moved in the summer. 
a good cheerleader to have. And I, I think the team you you're really watching for. This is another thing. I don't, I don't think this will be in season. But another thing I keep hearing is Schmidt in Chicago. Well, it's look at they just extended what's his name for four mil for two years. Felino there. And Schmidt does have a little bit of control. He's got a business in Mini. He wants to kind of stay close to home. I heard that's a team he would be be interested in going to as well. Well, that's a they they need. That's a young team that needs a guy like him too, right? Yeah. Like, look at the guys they brought. Like, I know the Perry thing didn't work out, but so they brought in yeah. Foligno. Well, they brought in uh, Hall. They they want good older players to kind of bring in their future. Yeah, but I think you're. I think it's he's too valuable right now to the dynamic of what's going on here, and he's so easy to cheer for, man. <laughs> he's the most down earth dude, but I I think he'll end up being like the press box seven. Which is fine. Um, the guys I don't think you're going to see on this roster potentially come the day after the deadline. I'd wonder about Chisholm. I'd wonder about Stanley. I'd wonder about Gustafson. I'd wonder about Kupari being in deals. Do we still have Capo Bianco? Yeah. So, like. And he, is he on the Jets roster right now? Moose. Well, I haven't even so, heard. That. So, I think you're going to try and get through with nine, that Capo being your ninth then. Which is fine. Yeah, I I think that's how he's going to approach this. That's just based on years past of prioritizing having as many D as humanly possible. I think you could see an upgrade and still see. Yeah. But but it's going to mean like an Appleton's going to have to go up front. Like you're going to have to move money somewhere. Yeah, I think the the free Villy crowd can get behind it too. Because like, how do you? Yeah, he had a great camp, but like, how do you? How can you be sad if he's not playing when this is what you're getting? Yeah, even me, I'm a, I'm a Billy guy. It's right now. It's not the time. No, I will say the first time. Like Nate Schmidt probably has to stay healthy to keep a, a roster spot in Winnipeg now, though. Yeah, yeah, he's got to keep a clean bill of health. Yeah, so nice to see Billy back. That's the, he's with the Moose as we expected. We get to gain a bit more cast space now. Actually, sending him back, which is a nice plus. Um, hoping to see him pick off where he left off with camp, because then things get really interesting. But then he also becomes a pretty big chip. Be, yeah, that's a... I have an NHL ready D-man. We're going to be talking about him as a trade chip at the deadline, I think. I think so, too. What uh, do you think we see Kyle Connor this week? Practicing in a regular jersey next practice. I could see it. I don't want probably two, two practices like that. Then probably get him in. I could see. I guess I'm giving him the week, though. So are they are they going to take Ehlers off for Connor? What do you think? I think they do. I'm going to be so upset. That's the one thing you're going to hear me sound off on if it happens. I just think I, you can't do it. I think they're going to. I think they're going to too. But They're going to say, oh, well, Ehlers put up this kind of production. Imagine what Kyle Connor could do. Cause yeah, Nick Ehlers is the better player, which is it's just so frustrating. And it's obvious. And the problem with the problem with that switch is then Nick Ehlers ends up on a line that gets played as the third line. Yep. It makes no sense. And the, the positives just outweigh it. Like you have this. One of the hottest lines in hockey. To the, to split it would be dumb, but then you have Perfetti and Connor. Per- Perfetti, Connor, and Nemesikov playing against NHL third lines and third pairings. Yeah, that would be the first big mistake that I'd be like, "Okay, come on." You have an elite goal scorer because he's an elite goal scorer. Mm-hmm. He is for sure. You have the opportunity to have him feasting on third lines and where his. Where his deficiencies won't hurt as much either. Yeah, because the Mastercard's great down low, and so was Perfetti. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's going to be an interesting one. Uh, another topic, Friedman. Winnipeg Jets really interested in, it, in signing Dylan DeMello, and they've recently reached contact with both Dylan, Brendan Dylan, and Dylan DeMello's agency. What do you think that might look like? I only think one gets signed. I think to, you got to keep DeMello... You playing with to. Morrissey, I it's hard to replace because his market value can't be that high. Like he's he's not a guy that gets talked about in the upper echelon. I would think a similar deal as what he's on, but it's hard to replace that sort of defensive ability um, in the mar- and especially in a free agent market. Finding a right-handed D man, good fucking luck. He, in my opinion, he's a top forty guy. I think on the right side. I think uh, I'd love to keep Brennan Dillon. Sam, I don't but. think you do more than two years. And I think that's where it gets tricky because I truly believe he wants to stay here. But I think him and his agency will know he can get like four years. He's having a nice bounce back. Like last year was a bounce back. This has been like 
a great Brendan Dillon season. Yeah, he's matched his career high in goals. He's on pace for career high in points. I think he's the type of guy a team would back up like th- three or four years. And the one thing is in Winnipeg right now, you have Dylan Sandberg ready to step into that slot. The question becomes, though, again, culture. Because much of we just talked about Nate Schmidt being... The problem... Okay, but part of that, though. Hold on, though. No, but I, I'm not advocating to keep him for that reason but i'm saying that's something the jets might the thing is you don't have you can't you you don't have the money to keep going down that route with every 30 plus guy like this is already an old team yeah people do got to realize that this core is old now you got like you do got to juggle winning now but you also got to juggle you're you're going to be paying cold profetti this summer gave velarde the summer after hopefully hopefully knock on wood yeah um nick healers the summer after like, as great as it would be to keep the band together, you got to have your eye on the summer, two summers out. And with Brendan Dillon, or not with it. You with, have the replacement. With Dillon else. Sandberg being as good as he is, it, it allows you to let him walk. There's That's a 2.5 mil difference right there. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I see what you're saying. And I, th- I think you see Hanela get the Schmidt job next year. Yeah, probably if he's not traded. Then you probably have Salmonson start in the A and Would he be over by next year, Salmonson? I thought he'd be over. That's cool. Yeah. So your your young D stable starts taking their steps internally, which allows you to use money in different ways. Like it's it would be hard. I I can't see them locking up both in season, still having the Pionk and Schmidt contracts on the board. All of a sudden you kinda end up where you were last year and we were talking about it kind of being an issue. Uh, obviously, getting out of Blake Wheeler helped that with the money. You would just get yourself back into that so, now being two or three years older. You you, you can't bring both back yeah. unless you're getting out of one of those other two before doing it. Yeah, I can see that. And I, I did, to, to Chevy's credit, because he had his his, uh, his presser, he admitted that uh, Nino Niederreiter has wanted to be extended in Winnipeg since the end of the season. And the Jets were the the party that was slow to uh, be there. So I think you might see a similar approach here. Yeah, I I think you're right on that. Any thoughts on Chevy's uh, State of the Union? I like the kind of we haven't done shit yet mentality. I know you've touched on this on Twitter. It's nice to see after years of the Jets kind of thinking they deserve more than they did. To kind of take a step back and and be like, no, like this, we're halfway through a season. A lot, lots still to come. I thought that was, I think Murat touched on it. It was a very confident Chevy. And I mean, how could you not be after the 2023 that he had? Yeah. The one thing that's, like, it's GM speak, but we're, when he's talking about uh, the deadline and finding fits instead of going out and getting the best, like, not that's verbatim. Finding fits, not just going out and getting the best guy. I, I don't know. That's kind of the one. I think you got to go out and get the best guy. So I didn't read that deeply into that one. I uh, Well, it's GM oh, talk. It's he's GM, gonna, yeah. He's going to do whatever. I, I uh, At this time last year, I was pretty pissed with Chevy State of the Union. This time around, I feel a lot differently in a better way. Uh, it was interesting to see the beat call it confidence because through YouTube, I just thought it was comfortable, but them being there, you'd get the feel, right? So it was definitely the most comfortable and confident version of Kevin Sheveldayoff we've seen. What I liked about it compared to years past, because you, you, you didn't get a lot and you're not going to get a lot from as far as what he's planning on doing from Chevy. I liked him going into some of the personal uh, detail of some of the stuff that led to here, like, even being honest about how the tough conversations from Rick Bonus's outburst actually helped them sign Hellbuck and Shifley and how talk telling Shifley he wasn't going to be the captain was like a hard thing that he had to process, but that's how much Shifley cares about this team and he get like gets like going into some of the personal such touches I think just connects the team with the GM and the players a lot better. And it just kind of, for me, he kind of added to the story that was being written. 
I loved him saying that too, what you said uh, about we haven't accomplished anything yet. Because in years past, something that pissed me off, not only with like Chevy, Maurice, Wheeler, the whole leadership group, was they always, when they were questioned or criticized when they were in like eighth place, they always talked about how, oh, we're an elite team, we're going we're gonna to figure it out, we're good, we're good. You saw the opposite approach this time where they are an elite team. They're showing this team is an elite NHL team. But now it's the mentality is we haven't done nothing yet. And I think they needed that organizational shift. I think it's been a big part of this. I don't think it's uh, – I also don't think it was uh, – it was a little bit of a surprise, but I think it was pretty telling that Chevy exposed Maurice a little bit and brought him up by name. As oh, far the, as Kyle the Kyle Connor, Connor thing, thing. Yeah. I thought that was fascinating insight, actually. And it just lays credence to a lot of what people had problems with Paul Maurice that weren't talked about or you were talked down on if you didn't like Paul Maurice because Paul Maurice loves Winnipeg, whatever bullshit that was. The GM just admitted that they saw different views of the most electric goal scorer in Winnipeg and how to use them. And he wanted him on the roster and the coach didn't. Yeah. So for me... You start connecting all that stuff. You start seeing, I think, truly, that summer going through that coaching change and finally talking to a vast range. Because when they first came in the league, it was Claude Noel. He was getting it no matter what because of his moose ties. That was a done deal. They didn't really they, – they hired him for – like, that was done. Then in season when you fire him, you're told by other GMs, go get Paul Maurice out of the K. So you didn't do a, a search. You just – Talk to the guy, teams told you to. The, that coaching search, I think, was really paramount. And yes, it ended up with Rick Bonus. We know all about the Barry Trot stuff. But they've all, they also talked to, what's his name in Vancouver? We know. Talk. They talked to Rick Tockett. Torts. They talked to Torts. And I think that was a big meeting that I, th- I would love to know more of the details because I believe Torts' meeting with Winnipeg, based on some stuff I've heard, was like a pretty interesting dynamic. Um, I think the organization finally getting to hear outside opinions because it had kind of stalled allowed this shift. And I, I think Kevin Shovel Dayoffs has grown from it. He just had, in my opinion, his best year as a GM. I think the Winnipeg Jets as an organization have grown from it. And we're now seeing a product that you can be proud of. So I just, I, I don't know. I thought it was cool. I thought it connected some dots for me on some stuff that didn't make sense in years past. And I, I thought it was it was well done for once, like not for once, but like compared to the last couple. No, you could say for once. His pressers usually <laughs> fucking suck. Those two last for the State of the Union, and then the post trade deadline. Yeah, you could not have had a two worse, worse back to back, back to back, and all. They they're usually terrible. Yeah, so uh, I thought that was good. Anything else you want to talk about today? Honestly, I don't think there's a lot of storylines that we didn't touch on there. If you want to get into the week, the I week ahead. It, it seemed like seemed like a quiet week storyline wise. Here's here's one quick one while I pull up the schedule. Um, released my first article of the year. Jets two C candidates. Any ones you liked on there? Probably didn't read today. Eh? Didn't Fuck. read today. Eh? Scumbag. What a guy. Eh? Um, I'm falling in love with Claude Giroux, man. And it's a tough sell with the no movement clause, but I think he fits this team. Yeah, like I'm so never so perfectly. I'm never gonna bet on someone with a full no move coming to Winnipeg. I know. I know we've seen it, it, but it's rare. I okay. So this is what's interesting. Actually, this is a combo I want to have. I'm glad. I'm glad we stumbled into it. I've had a few people lately reach out and be like, "Are you starting to get concerned that they're peaking too early?" What's your first thought to that? No, I don't believe in in that sort of thing. I, I think. It, if you're a good team in 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 November, you're probably going to be a good team for, throughout the year. Like I don't think peaking too early is a bad thing. Again, the only thing that worries me right now is the clean bill of health that the Jets have had for the most part, and potentially going backwards on that. Honestly, I'm not worried either um, because compared to years past, the underlying data is showing us that this yeah, team this is t- today 41 games in. Halfway through the season, they are a top five team in the NHL in five on five expected goals. That is a direct correlation to Stanley Cup contenders. Now, I like to, when I'm making my cup picks and stuff, I like to look at the last 20 to 30 game stretch because you can kind of see some momentum. You do get, there's teams that could hog on the playoffs. But this is, this is a team that's been through 
41 games, and despite having absolutely horrendous specialty teams, a top five five on five team, and the second best team in the standings. I'm not worried about the peak. I I will say, as fans and people that follow this, expect there's going to be a down downslide at some point. Yeah, there's <laughs> there might be a, a ten game stretch. stretch where they go five or four five and one, and I promise the world will not be coming to an end. But where I'm going with this is the one aspect of one of those stretches is I do get a little concerned if that stretch comes before the deadline. Yes, and I know where you're going with this. This is something I wish I brought up last week. Yeah. I texted you about it after. You did. We were talking about how important the Jets being in first was in order to not have to play one of the two other teams in the Central. But what's really important about the Jets being in first is it opens up your potential trade market. Now, a lot of players, like, we all know Winnipeg is not a destination. Players don't look to come to Winnipeg. Players don't wave to come to Winnipeg. Nobody is nobody's first choice. So in June, June, July, nothing happens. Like the Jets aren't a free agent team. Like we've seen it all. The benefit to being in first of the deadline is players that are on an expiring deal or have a year and a half left that are in the trade talks are going to be a lot more willing to come to Winnipeg if that team's still in first as opposed to fifth in the West or seventh in the West, or like like we've seen in years past. There's just so much better of a chance to, for someone to wave when the team is this good as opposed 100%. to they might win around, but they're not going far. That's, the Jets look like a team that could very well make another trip to the Western Conference Final. And that that is only going to pay dividends if this keeps up until the deadline and you have a, a Claude Giroux might be willing to come to Winnipeg even with his no-move clause because, well, I might have a chance to win a cup. Might have two chances. Might have two that. chances to win and a cup. And he's never won one yet. Yeah. And this is a guy that, when he got traded out of Philly, forced his way to Florida. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the type of things that these players do, and you could see it again with him next year. Mm-hmm. But when it's when you're this good and you're in Winnipeg, you have to maintain this tele-deadline and Chevy's got a strike on someone that's willing to move that no move to come to Winnipeg. Yeah, so I agree. Like the, the longer that this stretch goes on, the wider our pool of talent really does become. Uh, if we're in the top two in the Central or top one in the, in the entire NHL at the deadline, I don't see any rental not being able willing to. There'll still be some. There'll be some, but I, when it comes to rentals, where you're going to a three month spot. I, I would actually have us involved in all of them. And some of the nicer weather in Winnipeg, too, in that time. And, and you're living in a hotel wherever for three months, no matter where you're going, if you're a rental. So I, I if the higher we are, I would almost have every rental despite a trade clause. Because at that point, that guy wants to win. He's trying to increase his contract for the summer. How do you do that better than anything? You go to the best teams in the league. You look but what the, happened to What's-His-Face in Vegas there last year. You have a deep playoff run with a good team you're going to get paid more. And that's where Winnipeg will become attractive. The other thing is I had a conversation with someone, in the, uh, a player in the league, don't want to expose them or anything. But I was just like, how can Winnipeg change the dynamic? Like, how could we become more attractive? And the one thing they highlighted was the culture. They said that, yes, it was well known. It, we, we, we talked about the, the perceived culture problems. The fact we were talking about it, Trust me, the players around the league knew way more. There's a lot of stories starting to float out there about what was going on in Winnipeg the last couple of years. I got one for you after. It's pretty fucked. Um, but you're getting nothing but good vibes out of this group now that this could be a culture that can win. You're getting, you're getting the actual 5-on-5 five five performance that shows that this team can win. I don't see why a, a player wouldn't wave if this team is still there. But... If you start sliding, those questions are, are going to quickly come back because we've seen it happen with the core. Even if the problem children are gone, you need to keep this going into the deadline. Yeah. Um, the underrated one I really like, and we were talking about him over text, um, and Dimitri Filipovic texted me that he's doing an episode on Ryan Lambert's podcast, so I want to check it out about this fit. If you can get Casey Middlestat to moved out of Buffalo, I think he's the guy. Well, it's just his cap hit allows you to add more. Two and a half million dollars this year. 
He's really exploded offensively. The playmaking dynamic, I think, would fit really well with Perfetti and Connor in that we're trying to fi- find that mold in that. And they're going to play with different guys in the top six. I just see that fit. I do think it's going to be costly because he's an RFA too, and arguably he's been Buffalo's most complete player this year. What scares me though is, yeah, he might have may be one of their best players this year. Is look at who he's playing with. But look who you play with here. It could be a buy. Yeah, it could be a buy high thing though. Like, I'm taking. I'm taking Winnipeg's best players over Tage Thompson and Alex Tuck. Fair. Yeah. He's kind of like the Tage hype's kind of completely gone off the rails, eh? You know who Tage is. Tage is last year's Mark Shifley. He got a lot of hype, but like as a player, that's who he is. He's gonna score you forty. Plays really bad D. And some of them are going to look cool. Yeah, going to impact you offensively. Like The guy that w- we enjoyed and still had problems, that's who Tej is, for my money. Yeah, fair. It's cool because he's six foot seven while he does it, but and it looks different. But we're talking about a 40-goal scorer that doesn't do much else out- outside of de- defensively. Okay, let's get in the week ahead, though. Final thing, shout out Rick Bonus All-Star Game. Shout out Rick Bonus All Star Game, yes, um, first in his career. That's so crazy, eh? That's his first. Yeah, well, he's been working for a hundred goddamn years. I, I honestly wanted to shout out uh, Filipino Heritage Night and uh, the seatmates, uh, the legend from the Minnesota game that drew that excellent uh, sack squirtle sign with the Jets jersey. I happened to be sitting with her family last night, so I was talking to them about. Hockey and, like, the meaning of a Filipino Heritage Night. They were so fired up seeing the dancing and the singing and everything. But they kind of told me what got them into hockey. And they were actually down in Minnesota for a family trip. And the daughter was just super into the Jets and was super into the saxophone squirrel thing. So she made that poster and was was bugging her parents to go to the game. And they took her. And now her parents are, like, super invested into this. Uh, shout out to the Jets production staff getting her on the Jumbotron. That just made her whole night. And it's events like that for the kids you, you really like to see. It, it, it felt cool to kind of have that moment and see that moment. So shout out to the team continuing to embrace stuff like that. I just thought that was great. And I thought Filipino Heritage Night as a whole was really well done again. Wish I could afford one of those jerseys right now. <laughs> the merch, the, the hats and sweaters too. A little on the pricey side, the, the far from ordinary ones. But yeah, God, really, really well nice. done. Yeah, yeah. Um, two games this week before we talk again. Probably a week we could use after the stretch we went through. New York Islanders. Tuesday. I'm taking a... This is going to be a low-scoring game. This is going to be a one nothing or a 2-1 type of game. I'm going to go with the Jets because I can't see them losing two straight right now. So crazy we're at that point. Um... We'll feel really good about the Jets if Mark Shifley's playing. Um, I think, like I said before, Saturday's game really showed what this team could kind of look like without Mark Shifley. He's in that handful of guys for me. It's like him, Morrissey, DeMello, Hellebuck. That would really be hard to lose. Good place, yeah. Ehlers might be in it, too, if I'm being honest. But, you know what? I'll, st- I'll still take the Jets. I'll go, uh, I'll go a 3-1 game. And then Ottawa. The mess that is the Senators. Saturday afternoon game, where they might just send some guys on the plane back home with us. Might as well, yeah. Might as well. Uh, I'm going to go 5-1 Jets win in Ottawa Woo! Saturday. Woo! I think the Senators stink. I was not high on them at the start of the year. I don't, know. I, I don't think they're very good at all. They don't have goaltending. It, it's always problematic, too, when you start hearing that they basically need a trade for babysitters on the professional environment going on. Well, that's what the, the Jets have had to do the past few years. Uh, and like we've experienced it. Remember, yeah. Mark Hendrick, Matt, Matt Hendricks back-to-back. But you know that you're in a lot of trouble when that yeah. starts to become the thing. We could be seeing Cal Connor back by that point. Yeah. Uh, I, this is going to be a Jets offensive explosion. I'll go for two. I like the Jets too. Actually, before we leave, I want to touch on the Czech Hellbuck interview quickly. That detail. You sent it to, on just how detail oriented Connor Hellbuck. What was it like hearing some of that stuff that Czech Hellbuck had said about a, a 10 year old Connor Hellbuck? Oh, the getting to know the blades. So, uh, so that he knew where the puck was going. And then there Turning was down a f- camps. Yeah. And then there was a follow-up, uh, so I think NHL Network did an interview with Halbuck over one of those 
cross crease pad saves and all he said was well based off where his blade was there's only one way he can go and I was talking to a goalie friend of mine who's he's obviously not an NHL goalie but he's like yeah that's that's you read shots based off the position of the stick so obviously if if you're an NHL caliber goalie you are a lot better at it yeah and clearly the work was put in from a, a young age with Hellbuck, and it was just a cool story that he Chuck shared on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk there. Yeah, I thought that was a great interview on Winnipeg Sports Talk. It was just so fascinating. At 10 years old, he was going around the store looking at every single blade, and he says to his dad, like, i got to study every single one of these so I know how the puck's coming off. And then to hear his version of it on NHL, it was a perfect like back-to-back moment this week in media um, because I think it was a former player that asked him too. He's like, as forward, should we be just shooting this along the ice because goalies are like diving over in the air? And Hellbuck so confidently too says, no, we already know where you're shooting it because of the angle of your blade and everything. Like He's like, if you're reacting in the NHL, you're already too late. Like You just have to read the game at such a level. Uh, I thought it was interesting too. Joey Decord, who's been on an absolute freakish stretch in Seattle, they've got like ten straight games now too. <laughs> yeah, on the back of Decord, who we traded to GC in our fantasy league, and then he went off. <laughs> Fuck. Um, he had an interview as well talking about goaltending, and he said right now because they were talking about there's some goalies succeeding. I think Decord fits under this mold. Connor Hellbuck definitely fits under this mold, succeeding without being necessarily over overly athletic. And Decord said, like, for his money, the most two valuable skills in the NHL for a goaltender now are being able to skate well and be able to read the game at an elite level. That's that's NHL goaltending in this generation. And we know we have one of the best guys at doing that because even at his best, you don't think he's playing that well because he's so big and boring and getting to impossible plays early. That stat when the Jets are up by one is absolutely bizarre. Bonkers. Yeah. If you, if you haven't seen it. When the Jets are up a goal, Connor Hellebuck's save percentage is a 9.75. Second best of the league is 9.34, which is still Demko, and that's who they were using to highlight it was Demko's yeah, it's season. Still elite. 9.75. If if the Jets get a one goal lead with Connor Hellebuck, nuts. It's too bad they always start behind. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll take off there. Thank you um, so much for supporting. Thank you so much for listening. The community and Comments and DMs and stuff has been fantastic lately. Didn't really expect the overwhelming support on that CBC hit, so thank you for that. That was like it felt it felt good to see the the reaction to that. And we'll be back next week. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we have some new things cooking now. So we'll see, we'll save that until it's finalized. Though. This has been a Top Line Media production.